to ship to the to the east and north by maybe 50 to 75 miles. We would still have some boreal forest in northern Minnesota. White pine would actually probably do much better in the boundary waters than it does now because right now it's a little bit too cold for optimal growth of white pine. So places like the boundary waters might actually see more white pine. Um, and we would still have lots of room for temperate deciduous, or in other words, maple, basswood, and oak forest through most of the state. But for the business as usual scenario, it's a completely different story. We become the new Kansas, so to speak. So 90% of Minnesota would have a climate that would only support prairie. And there would be little pieces of temperate deciduous forest on the north sides of hills in the southeastern in the driftless area of southeastern Minnesota and the the tip of the arrowhead probably um, Cook County maybe a little bit of Lake County would have oak and maple forest in northeastern Minnesota the boreal would be gone uh, we probably wouldn't have any conifers left um, in Minnesota at least not the boreal conifers maybe we would have juniper but um, so that it's a huge, huge difference. And um, I don't need to tell you that when you shift the, the habitat type, the vegetation, you're gonna shift the, the um, species of wildlife that lives there and that includes birds. Um, and I gave the example of one of my favorite birds, black-backed woodpecker potentially moving out and being replaced by red-bellied woodpecker, um, which I found out is already starting to happen. So, but many, many different uh, wildlife changes would occur. So that's a, um, I think that's enough for a summary. I'd like to hear what questions people want to ask. Thanks, Lee. Uh, like I said, questions, if you've got them, uh, right over in the chat bar. Um, I personally thought it was very interesting, Lee, if, if, if I can fill a little time with some, some thoughts. Um, the, the, the edginess that you mentioned was very interesting. Um, and being a, being a prairie kid, it's always fun to hear about edges and all of that. So I, I appreciated that and learning a little bit about trees moving. That's always kind of fun. We, we think about birds moving and birds adaptations to trees, but it's hard to sort of think about how a tree moves from A to B. So that was, that was very interesting. Um, questions. We've got a couple of minutes here, folks. If you have questions, like I said, feel free. Use that chat bar. Um, we'll, we'll use that through the sort of run of things today. Don't be shy about questions. Very good, so we've got a couple coming in. Thanks everybody. All right, so we'll just run from the top. Uh, so this is from Kelly and Greg. Um, how do you human caused changes in uh, land use accelerate or slow down changes caused by climate change? Okay, well, human land use changes would tend to accelerate that because um, as we change the landscape, we tend to introduce invasive species. Those compete with trees, um, especially the invasive earthworms that we've introduced all over the place tend to dry the soil and so that would exacerbate the drought effects we expect with a warmer climate. We create a landscape with lots of edges and high deer populations. They eat tree seedlings, so they're just a lot more factors that would work against trees in Minnesota um, due to human activities across the landscape. And that includes exotic diseases and insect pests of trees, of which they're now 400 and 80 known species in North America. Uh, and then one last one, and I think this one's a pretty interesting one because I don't know really anything about soils. So I'm gonna ask the soils question. So this is from Anna George. Will Canada's soil support trees moving north from Minnesota? Yeah, the, the soils in Canada, I mean, trees don't need very much soil really. They can grow in very shallow soils on bedrock like they are in the Boundary Waters and like they do in parts of Southeastern Minnesota. They just need a surplus of rainfall over evaporation each year. And with that, they can grow in some pretty 
poor environment. So yeah, what won't be supported is movement of the corn belt from south, southwestern Minnesota, the Bounty Waters, because you can't grow corn in crevices in granite. Uh, so yeah, the, it, the trees will do just fine further north unless the climate changes so fast that they all die before they can move and we end up with no trees at all, which I suppose is a possibility. Sure. Well, well, very good. I don't know if we have time to squeeze one more in. Um, so thanks, there's a, there's a whole slew of questions. Um, thanks everybody for, for popping in with questions. Um, and yeah, we're just gonna have a, a quick couple for each, each person, but um, thank you, Lee. Um, thanks for the summary. Thanks for answering a few questions. Um, and we will um, move right along with our second speaker, Tyler, Tyler Imfeld. Good morning, everybody. So yeah, so my name is Tyler Imfeld. Um, I'm actually joining you from Denver, Colorado, so I'm not in Minnesota any longer. I recently earned my PhD from the University of Minnesota. I graduated from, uh, from Keith Barker's lab in the Ecology, Evolution, and Behavior graduate program, but I'm now teaching at uh, uh, Regis University, so teaching ecology, statistics, and, and trying to squeeze in ornithological stuff every, every possible place that I can. So my talk was all about Minnesota's songbirds and, and where they came from over, over deep time, over evolutionary time scales. And so I sort of told that story using museum specimens, DNA extracted from museum specimens, you know, information about where species occur in the modern day, and then combining all of these with a little bit of theory and a little bit of statistics from evolutionary biology. And this gives us the ability to look back in time, so to speak, and infer where entire groups of birds had originated, you know, in the, in the deep past, tens of millions of years ago. And then we can look at how they've moved across the globe since then. So my talk was all about my dissertation research, which built on work that showed that songbirds as a whole, you know, as a large group of organisms, actually originated in Australasia, so a landmass that used to contain both Australia and New Guinea sort of concatenated together. And my research concluded that songbirds have since dispersed out of the Eastern Hemisphere into the Western Hemisphere into the Americas at least 46 separate times during the last 20 to 30 million years. So our community of, of songbirds that um, you know, I, I'm missing dearly in Minnesota, but the ones that I see in uh, Denver and, you know, anywhere in the Western Hemisphere came about as, as, a, as a result of a really dynamic history. And the majority of these dispersal events, we suspect, took place over the Bering Land Bridge. So this is from East Asia into North America and then southward spreading from there. But there are a few instances where there were some intrepid explorers that you know, so, or, or, you know, avian explorers that crossed entire oceans to get here, especially in the thrushes and finches, which is totally, totally wild. The results of these dispersal events have been super variable, you know, yielding a single species in some cases, all the way up to 830 some odd species in the emberizoids, so that large super family that includes all of Minnesota's warblers, our cardinals, Tanagers, blackbirds, spindalis, spring thrushes, like all an enormous panoply of really remarkable songbirds. And so this, this whole history of passerines and songbirds in particular, you know, colonizing and moving all over the globe is really fascinating, but this is a story that's nowhere near over. You know, human-assisted dispersal events, natural dispersal events that are still continuing, and uh, accelerated anthropogenic climate change are ultimately going to continue driving the evolution of, of songbird communities, not just, you know, within Minnesota or Colorado, but, but the globe as a whole. So this is a really long story to tell, and we're only at the tip of the iceberg at this point. Excellent. Uh, so a couple questions coming in. Um, first one uh, from Allie, how do you extract the DNA from museum specimens, uh, and what kind of approval process do you need to go through and collect it? Gotcha. So yeah, that's, that's a great question. Uh, you can't just do this like in your, in your dining room or in your basement. We have permits at all of the labs and natural history museums to actually possess bird remains, including tissues and, and DNA samples. So all of this is done within the ecology building on the, on the St. Paul campus. And it's relatively straightforward. The entire process, you can go from a little tube of frozen tissue to really rich 
DNA samples in less than 24 hours. It's been relatively simple to do. And there's literally like box kits where you essentially have to you know, take a small little subset. Imagine like a piece of dried lentil. That's about how much tissue you need in order to get just tons and to like in the, in the molecular sense, tons of, of DNA. Sure. Shred it up a little bit, digest it with some proteinase, and then, you know, with a series of buffer washes and spinning it down and pull this liquid off, then wash it again, pull this liquid off, and then suddenly, ta-da, you have, you know, I, I, I always think of the scene from Jurassic Park, bingo, dino, DNA. <laughs> and so it, you oftentimes have way more DNA than you need. And we have really, you know, sensitive techniques in the lab where I've been able to extract DNA from bird specimens that were collected in Brazil over a hundred years ago. So, wow. and we've, we've also been able to extract DNA from most of the Bell Museum's passenger pigeons as well, which are obviously an extinct species. Sure. So the technology is easy and it's getting easier and, and more effective, but it's all, it's all done in very carefully permitted spaces, right? We have permits to have these specimens and the tissues in the first place. Excellent. A couple more popping in. Uh, uh, let's see here. Um, Jerry, Jerry Hoekstra has a good question here. So you say that four of the seven thrushes arrived here in three or more transatlantic events. How do we know that they didn't use the land bridge? Gotcha. Yeah. So the, so the thrushes, if you remember from the talk, are one of these like absolute globe trotter groups of organisms. The family Turtidae is one of the only songbirds that made it to the Hawaiian archipelago. So we, we know that they are very, very good at flying around. And so how we determine that they, ultimately, these are all based on likelihood, you know, with, in the absence of fossils, which we are never going to have a good fossil record for passerines. They're very small. They have bad bones. They're terrible fossils. Uh, any, any fossil songbird we have is a blessing. So this is why we use these tools of historical biogeography and, doing the, and comparing multiple modeling approaches where basically you have the evolutionary tree of this group, right, for the whole family, Turtidae, or just the genus of thrushes, the genus Turtus. And then you code all of the tips based on where they occur. And so thrushes are really widespread. You know, they go all the way throughout you know, Indonesia, North and South America, all of Eurasia and Africa. So you call it all these species and compare a series of models to one another. And what actually comes out of these models is that the closest relatives to a lot of uh, the early diverging, so to speak, um, thrushes in North America are entirely within tropical Africa. And then you can see later on, you know, there will be one branch leading out of this strongly North American group that suddenly appears in, in Asia or in, or in Europe. So maybe they were, you know, hopping across land bridges, but, you know, we know they fly very well. I mean, we have vagrant Eurasian thrushes show up all throughout North America and vice versa. So it, I will say that that is fairly contentious. There is a, a newer study that came out this past year suggesting a very different history. But this is a group that's just hard to hard to parse out evolutionarily. They have a lot of conflict in the phylogeny. Awesome. Thank you, Tyler. Sure. Uh, moving along to our next speaker, Scott Mayhew. Scott, are you here? I am. Excellent. Thanks. Quick All little right. spiel and we're on to questions. Sure, thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Scott Mayhew. I'm the Education Director at the National Eagle Center in Wabasha. Uh, my presentation was sharing um, information on the Golden Eagle survey that I started uh, back in 2005 to get people out uh, looking for Golden Eagles in Southeast Minnesota and Western Wisconsin, as I was finding many more than had been previously reported. Uh, so I trained some folks and my friends of mine to get people out, and that survey has been going since 2005. And now this last year's survey, we had over 200 uh, observers out um, covering 71 different survey areas uh, in Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Iowa. Uh, we covered over 40 counties and uh, over uh, 450 hours of, of surveying with well over 5,000 miles driven backcountry roads of uh, Southeast Minnesota, Western Wisconsin, basically the driftless area uh, looking for golden eagles. And uh, the, this year we had 119 uh, golden eagles on survey day. Uh, compare that with over 1,403 
bald eagles on survey day. And remember, we're looking for golden eagles, and so we're not along the river. Uh, we're in the bluff country, so it really shows you how dramatic of a size of population of bald eagles that overwinters. Yes, the Mississippi River is known for them overwintering, but we have a large number uh, in, out in the rural areas as well. And so, shared a little bit about that. Uh, we uh, talked about the uh, partnership then that was formed uh, with uh, Minnesota Audubon and National Eagle Center and the Minnesota DNR non-game wildlife, uh, along with Wisconsin DNR and Fish and Wildlife Service. We decided that we wanted to learn a little bit more about this population that was kind of unnoticed for the most part. We knew there were a few key locations that the bird watchers that always went to go to see them, but we were finding them in other locations. And so we wanted to learn a little bit more about that population. And so thankfully, Mark Martel, uh, who, um, you know, I was kind of the education side of things. Mark had the research background and uh, was a wonderful way to mentor with him and learn a lot from Mark Martel. And then Carol Henderson, I really give a shout out to Carol of getting some money for funding. Uh, always just doing a great job of keeping everybody in in, in line of what they want, want to do with the research and things like that and helping people all along the line. And so getting some satellite transfers on so that we could understand the, the tracking movements, where these birds are coming from, because the thought was these birds were coming from out west. Uh, we learned that these birds are wintering here in Minnesota, arriving in mid to late October uh, and leaving by February and March, and then migrating about two, one to 2,000 miles north into the northern parts of Canada uh, into um, Nunavut uh, near Churchill, Manitoba, uh, areas of there where they're spending the summers. And so we, we learned that. Um, and then uh, we also then wanted to a little, little bit more understand the wintering habitat needs of the, of the golden eagle. And we're learning a little bit about that, but we definitely know there's more to learn on that end. But one of the areas that I shared with the habitats that I see them spending a lot of time near is the goat prairie habitat, uh, an area that I think they rely on for thermal lift and or a graphic lift, but more importantly, for accessing prey, such as squirrels and rabbits and turkeys that might be out in the open, that the golden eagles can come along the back side of the bluff and come down and catch those prey species out in the open. Uh, but as we know, with the stopping of fire in the landscape, um, red cedar and other uh, species have taken over that ha habitat. And uh, so helping to work with the fire uh, restoration so that we can talk about the other less charismatic species that rely on that same wintering habitat that the golden eagle relies on, but in the summertime, there's a whole host of species that rely on that same habitat that is uh, div very diverse from prairie wildflowers, of course, birds, uh, skinks, and you name it, a whole host of things that rely on that same habitat. And so beginning to understand a little bit better. And uh, so first, I, I would also like to say before those questions, uh, I, that's about as quick a recap as I can do. Uh, the uh, thank you to all the surveyors. I cannot see everybody's faces on there, but I know on my screen right now, I'm looking at Don Vercota, who's been helping with it for years, but I know there's others. Uh, Clinton, I know years ago you helped with the survey and there's other people, I hate to do that because thank you all MOU people who have helped with the survey. Like I say, over 200 surveyor citizen scientists uh, study that's been going on since 2005. And so thank you all for uh, that. The survey is happened this year. It's always the third Saturday in January. It's kind of nice to uh, do your Christmas bird counts, then you kind of go through a Christmas bird count withdrawal. <laughs> All right, I gotcha, it's the third Saturday in January. Uh, only thing is to require to do your own survey area is we do uh, require a several hour training session. Those training sessions like this will be offered virtually this year. And so people are interested in helping with a survey. To have your own survey area, you have to attend one of these survey trainings. You can go to Golden at National Eagle Center to send me an email about that. If you cannot attend one of those, but you still want to help on survey day, we're always looking for people to join with other survey routes as extra sets of eyes. So feel free to uh, let me know, be glad to help people. And as we started the survey and it started the program, it was really thinking about the Driftless area because that's where I lived and that's where I thought the Golden Eagles were. But we learned through a bird that was released at Hawk Ridge named Jack by Frank Nicoletti and crew that ended up down in Southern Missouri and, and uh, Northern Arkansas. Uh, the folks at Camp Ripley, Brian Dirks and uh, William Faber, have been finding birds in the Camp Ripley area. Uh, and so it is across Minnesota these birds are wintering. And so anywhere in Minnesota, I could use your help. Perfect. Uh, one quick question here before we, we have to move on. A uh, question from Bob. In general, are you seeing bald and golden eagles sharing the same territories in the southeast? And do they get along in those territories? Yeah, good question. So for the most part, uh, they share the same territories. Uh, there is some um, interactions, we may have especially with the, the bald eagles chasing after the golden eagles. Uh, when the golden eagles catch a squirrel, 
uh, or a rabbit, uh, and they're carrying that to a tree. I often see the bald eagles right on their tails uh, chasing after them and stealing prey from them. And so I, I do see that uh, happening. And as we have more and more uh, bald eagles in those uh, rural areas, uh, I think we'll see more of that type of habitat intrusion. Sure. Uh, and with a couple of seconds, and I think my connection is sort of a little wonky, so sorry, everybody. Uh, how are landowner attitudes towards golden eagles in southeastern Minnesota, and have those attitudes changed? Yeah, so the, the good, well, the part of the, as relates to the goat prey habitat is, is that I have uh, had several wonderful relationships with folks over the years that own private land uh, in southeast Minnesota, western Wisconsin, where there is goat prey habitat. And once they learned about golden eagles and the, the re relationship with that particular species of that habitat, they were fascinated by it. They didn't know about golden eagles. Um, if, if you had went in as a land manager started talking about skinks or, uh, you know, blue stem or grasses or whatever, you know, you might not have got their attention, but a golden eagle is a pretty unique uh, charismatic megafauna that'll help uh, draw somebody into the, into the cause. And uh, in fact, just this last week, I was out leading a tour uh, looking for golden eagles. We do some habitat tours here at the Eagle Center. And, and uh, the very next day, the, the couple that I took out went out into that same area and the local landowner drove by uh, on his tractor, pulled over and was asking what they're looking at. They said golden eagles. He said, oh, he said, I got a cool photo I got this year of a golden eagle uh, going after a white-tailed deer uh, on a trail cam. And uh, I have seen several of th those instances over the years as well of golden eagles going after a white-tailed deer, never being successful, but, but if you can kill a turkey, wow, that's pretty impressive. You might as well try a deer as well. And uh, so, uh, yeah, he sent me the photo and, and, and pretty cool. And so I guess overall, back to the original question, I think overall there is an understanding that it's a cool, unique uh, bird. Uh, they want to learn more about it and they want to protect its habitat. Scott, thank you so much. Uh, you. Shanta, I see you there. Welcome. Hi. All right, so my name is Shanta Hedgemati, and I'm a, a fourth year PhD student at the University of Minnesota in the Ecology, Evolution, and Behavior Department. I'm also advised, or I'm part of the same lab that Tyler graduated from, so I'm advised by Keith Barker. Um, and my talk was the one that had the giant, incomprehensible name full of big, sciencey words. And which I immediately changed as soon as we got into the presentation to fantastic raptors and where to find them. Um, so the big question that I'm looking at in this talk is about whether or not we can tell how communities of raptors all over the world got to be the way that they are. Why are some species here and other species there? What are the, what are the sort of differences in how those species are related to each other across the world? What are the differences in how um, similar they are to each other across the world? And does that any, tell us anything about how they got there in the first place? Um, and you know, to, to do this, I did a number of different things. I used a lot of measurements that I took off of museum specimens. I was using a phylogenetic tree that somebody else created, which is you know, a, a better one is a down the line in my own research. Um, but I also did, um, similar to what Tyler was talking about, a biogeographic history so I could see sort of when those colonization events happened along the evolutionary history of these birds. And also thought a little more deeply about the history of the actual land itself. And we did some world traveling, so I didn't actually say anything about Minnesota because I thought we all needed a break from being in our homes. Um, <laughs> and the three continents that I looked at more closely were Africa, Austra Australia, and South America. So each of these places has a really interesting and sort of unique story that you can tell with these data. Um, in Africa, it was pretty consistent with basically um, hawks and eagles evolved in Africa and spread out on the continent and that the signature of that is fairly clear and what you can see. Whereas in Australia, habitats have changed there really drastically in the last two and a half million years going from mostly forests to like mostly deserts. And you can really see that clearly as well in the data and that there's a lot of relatively similar species that have colonized relatively recently. Um, South America is really complex, partly because um, we've got two groups of raptors that I'm looking at, the hawks and falcons and eagles, as well as the falcons and caracaras and falconets. 
And these two groups of raptors, while in most of the world, the hawks and eagles are driving most of the patterns, there are so many falcons in South America that you have to look at them separately. And it turns out that um, we knew this already, but falcons evolved originally in South America, and that has a lot to do with what their communities, what, the, what their contribution to the raptor communities look like in South America. And um, hawks evolved elsewhere and colonized later, which you can also sort of see patterns from that. So it was, it's basically, this is the first sort of study that anybody's done looking at these kinds of patterns across the entire world and seeing what they tell us. Um, so anyway, I hope you enjoyed the talk and that you weren't scared off by the big scary title. Let's see, I'm seeing, I'm looking at questions here in the chat. Clinton, you there? Clinton seems to be off. Here, I'll, I can, I'll read the questions, it's okay, I can see the chat. Uh, it says, to understand these complex findings, it would be helpful to have concrete examples. For instance, since most ranges have the full range of uh, raptors from falcons to eagles to small and large hawks, how do we, how is it the raptors in some locations have low trait diversity? This is a great question. So I think maybe the best example to compare between these two would be the example of like Australia versus South America. So in Australia, you have got a situation, and this is actually, there is a southeastern coastal community in Australia that I put up on one of the early slides in my talk where you don't have any vultures at all. So anybody that's doing carrion eating is probably an eagle or just a generalist that likes to eat relatively fresh meat. Um, you've got a lot of like medium sized things and you've got a few falcons. Whereas over in South America, we have this like just gigantic diversity of stuff, not just because you have more species, but you have many different species happening there. You've got three different kinds of, of falcon species. So falcons aren't just our, um, our peregrine falcons that we're used to here. In fact, that group of falcons has basically just dispersed all over the world and you rarely find more than about four-ish species of those things in any given place. Um, except for South America where they hardly occur at all, where you, what you get otherwise uh, in the falcons is you get caracars, which are these like weird long-legged things that look, uh, I don't know, they like got these big thick legs and they run around on the ground and they've got sort of big sturdy beaks. They kind of remind you of like a really tough roadrunner. Um, and you've got forest falcons, which are basically what a, a falcon would look like if it evolved into accipiters. Uh, they've got these really long tails, short wings, they live in the forest. Um, and so you can get a much um, a, a broader array of trait diversity when you've got lots of different things. And also a lot of the trait diversity that I'm looking at, a, a major component of it is size. Um, so for instance, Australia, the environment is very harsh. There's just fewer ways to make a living there. And so you get things that look more similar to each other. Um, did I answer your question, Stephen? Thank you for that question. I, I don't see, I, I'm going to take over. I don't see Clinton still on the line. <laughs> Perhaps yeah, he- I don't know uh, what happened to him. He lost- I think the, the am, I, am I back? Okay, now you're, you're back. back. Yeah, yeah you're okay. Back. The, the internet is going weird at the folk school, so I'm sorry, everybody. Um, thanks. I think, I think we answered questions. Thanks for answering questions and asking questions, everybody. <laughs> yeah, and uh, I, it's, Scott was like, likes my background. This is from the Bell Museum. Um, in fact, you can probably, if you like it, you can go to their website and you can download some really cool backgrounds. There's another one that was good for Thanksgiving that has like turkey feathers behind you, so it looks like you're a turkey. That's one of my favorites. Very good. Well, well, thanks, uh, Shanta. Thanks for your talk, and thanks for questions, everybody. Um, and uh, we'll we'll move to the next speaker, which which is me. So I'll I'll crank this out real fast in case I disappear again. Um, and if you've got questions, I'll I'll hope to answer them uh, when I can. Um, so, uh, like I said, my name is uh, Clinton Dexter House. I'm the head naturalist with the Friends of Saxon Bog. Uh, and I talked a little bit about uh, our uh, Kestrel project. So um, we've sort of had this ongoing, hopefully to be long-term uh, project banding uh, American Kestrels um, in the bog. 
And so uh, the project has sort of grown from the beginning. We, we really only had 14 boxes. And when I took over, um, we didn't really have a good monitoring protocol set. I mean, we, we didn't have a way to look in boxes. So we were just like observing boxes for a while and seeing what happens. And if you've watched nest boxes with raptors in them, at least not a lot happens ever. Um, you can watch a peregrine box all day and maybe you'll see something happen, but um, kestrels are really no different. So um, we've had a, a, a really big change now with the GoPro and monitoring with the GoPro, um, getting into these boxes and, and sort of across the bog's landscape. So if you're not familiar, the bog is about 300 square miles. It's a, it's a big place. Um, and so we've got uh, presently about, uh, about 50 boxes. So we're a couple shy of 50. Um, much of the, the data that I shared, much of what I showed was from a three year period, 2018, 19, and 20. Um, our protocols were the same, the box numbers were the same, um, pretty consistent data for that, that time frame. Um, and, and yeah, we basically the, the big thing that, that I found and, and got out of this whole project so far is that our success rates are pretty high. Uh, a lot of other nest box projects have, you know, 80% success rates for nestlings. Um, we're right about 94, um, which is pretty good. Um, we're averaging about five eggs a clutch. We're averaging about four chicks per banding session um, from those boxes, which is really good. Um, kestrels are pretty variable in their egg laying. Ours generally are on that high end. So we've got an average of about five eggs a clutch. Uh, that's pretty good. Um, you know, you could range from three in some years, depending on the condition. Um, this year, we also had a box that had six eggs in it, um, which is crazy. Um, it was a weird thing. They, they nested and then they must have failed, but they re-nested a full clutch basically. And it, it was pretty bonkers, but um, yeah, lots of information about that. If you want to learn more about the nest box project, um, I put it in at the end slide, but um, I, I do a sort of a review and a revision of the year um, in our blog. Uh, and so for the last three years, for sure, you have a nice full picture of what we did, what happened, how it went. But the intention was, uh, that I was hoping to, to, to put information out that you could use and to make it useful for folks who wanted to try something like this. Um, I've got good questions from folks who do some stuff like this, Julian Sellers in particular, uh, a whole bunch of nice questions talking about Kestrels in St. Paul too. So uh, there's projects going on uh, across the US uh, and we just have a, a little portion of that, so. Seems like the, um connection for the bog is a little touchy this morning and um, we've lost Clinton so we can't actually ask it ask our questions because he's not here to answer them um, maybe we can maybe we can get back to that um, if it's okay I think we will keep going so that we don't get too far off schedule and if Clinton comes back on we will um, slip him in um, the next uh, presentation was Keith Barker. Uh, I saw Keith on earlier, and Keith is, uh, many of the pre previous presenters have come from Keith's lab, which is spectacular. And uh, Keith had a presentation on uh, Western Hemisphere impact of, of diversity. And so we would like uh, Keith to give us his uh, short summary of his talk, and then we'll take questions. Thanks, Dick. Um, yeah, so my talk was kind of a um, recollection of, you know, years of working on phylogenetics in lots of different groups and just realizing that, you know, I'm studying evolution, I'm studying genes, um, which seems a little divorced from things like on the ground conservation. But when you're in the business of, you know, looking at um, genetic variation across the range of species, you find things. And sometimes you find, you know, species in the drawer in, in systematics, things that people have collected that nobody realized were that distinct because the modalities that animals use to recognize one another, say at the species level, aren't necessarily the ones that we use and or aren't the ones that are preserved in museum specimens. So things like behaviors and scents and that sort of thing. But, you know, I've worked on, worked on lots of different groups of Western Hemisphere birds and multiple um, 
the blackbirds, um, where I talked about um, the, the uh, slender-billed grackle, but also red-winged blackbirds, which I didn't have time to talk about, have a distinctive form that's in central Mexico. Um, the wren, the marsh wren, uh, which I have shown with genetic data and with um, collaborators on things like the behavioral data indicate as a, a good species um, in central Mexico. And um, the, like the phylogeny of warblers also has a distinct form that which I talked about briefly, the uh, black polled warbler. So that this, these wetlands in central Mexico keep jumping up as being important. important um, and they preserve, or in some cases fail to, have failed to preserve some interesting lineages that are distinct there, including the, that slender billed grackle, which is extinct. And we think this yellow um, rail population that used to be in the upper Rio Lerma Valley is probably extirpated. Um, we don't yet know if it was a distinct species, although it was originally described as a distinct species. It was later um, lumped together with the rest of the yellow rails. But that's something that's sitting in our drawer waiting to be answered using genetic techniques. As Tyler mentioned, we can easily get DNA from these samples. Um, and, you know, there's mm, you know, all kinds of examples that I didn't really have time to talk about. I originally wanted to talk about lots of examples from across the Western Hemisphere, including um, the grebe example and the, um, the marsh bird from, from Brazil, but time just, you know, doesn't allow us to, to talk about all of these great things. But yeah, wetlands are intensely used for agriculture um, and they're impacted by urban development in lots of places including, as I mentioned, lots of places here uh, in the U.S. We, in Cal Southern California, we had um, the Tulare Lake Basin, which was one of the largest wetland complexes in the Western Hemisphere. And now you can only see it um, as an impression in a satellite photo um, where it's covered with tomato fields, um, unfortunately. So, and we don't know if that lake had any endemic forms. Um, it wasn't extensively collected um, before it disappeared. It's possible there was a, there were rails there, there were warblers there. We just, we don't know. Um, and that's, things like that are happening right now. And I wanna bring it to people's attention and you know start, try to get people to think about the fact that we're losing this biodiversity, not just ex extirpation of local populations, like in the um, total single, base in the east of Mexico City, but also entire species potentially. So, so, so I have a so question here. About, Keith, there's, can you see the questions there? I can, I, I can read it for myself if, you, if that's okay. Yep, go ahead. Uh, somebody said, uh, oh, Clint, Clinton asked, yeah, I talked about eBird. Has that been useful tool for confirmation of species, subspecies in your studies? Would you encourage more subspecific level entries in eBird where appropriate? Um, yeah, if there are very good um, morphological or behavioral um, traits that can be heard by field um, workers, then yeah, that would, that would be great. Um, I, I noticed in the talk, or I noted in the talk that there are records from further west in the transvolcanic belt of Toluca Wren which are not reflected in specimen data. And um, it's still possible. Um, I've looked, actually a couple of them have photos, uh, but it's really hard to tell from a photo if it's really Toluca wren, even though they're morphologically dis distinct, they have a really dark belly. Um, or if it might be like a late lingering um, Western marsh wren, or um, I, I would really not like to have some um, recordings from those birds because we know that they're distinct in their songs um, and ideally um, some kind of genetic sample, uh, whether that was a museum specimen or even just a feather sample would be useful. And then somebody else is asking, oh Mike is asking, are programs like Ducks Unlimited and Marsh Restorations providing knock-on benefits for these species? For sure, for sure in, um, in the U.S. Um, wetland species are one, the one group of birds that's really um, gone down, but now is increasing significantly because of wetland restorations associated with duck hunting. 
And actually, I think that's true in Mexico, too. There are a few wetlands like um, Tecocomulco in Hidalgo and also in the Rio Lerma, where it's very clearly managed to some degree for duck hunting. And that definitely ha has impacts on things like the marsh wrens and the black pole warblers, the rails, and the other things that coexist with the ducks in those areas. So we have time for one more question. And last question, and then I'll, and then add to it the res what is your res what is the response of the people in Mexico to this kind of work? Okay, um, so the question was: Do you have any sense of how much wetland is left to save, and uh, and whether there are local conservation efforts? Yes, there are definitely um, local conservation efforts. Um, as we know, in some cases, tragically, when conservation concerns conflict with uh, local land use, that can result in um, death. Uh, the recent murder of um, a man who is really intimately involved with preserving monarch um, butterfly habitat in the Transvolcanic Belt is an example of that, unfortunately. And also in Brazil, uh, people uh, who are involved in conservation that come into conflict, conflict with people who want to do, do extractive work on those same lands have been threatened and or killed. Um, but there is plenty left to save, but it's, been, it's, it's hard work to do. And then, sorry, Dick, what was your question? The response of the people in Mexico, but you've sort of a, have answered it. Yeah, people know, um, people know, for instance, that the situation in Mexico City right now with regard to water, both extraction for, for drinking water and um, pollution of streams by pumping out of, sew of relatively untreated sewage is not sustainable. But, and people are working hard to try to fix that, but it's, it's a huge, huge problem. It's the largest city in the Western Hemisphere. <laughs> it's a big challenge. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Dave. Right. Thank you. Good, so we'll go ahead um, and uh, let's see if I can get this to work to um, there we go. Okay, so now uh, the next the next speaker is Mike Wells uh, from Fish and Wildlife Service, and uh, he's going to talk about the uh, identifying habitat conservation opportunities using radar and, and uh, I'll go ahead and please post, post your questions for Mike and I will uh, full, full, uh, pick up for Clinton here. All right, <clears throat> hi everybody, uh, can you all hear me? Okay, great, uh, just, just double checking on the, the connections have been spotty all morning. So um, yeah, I'm a biologist at the US Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, my talk was a little bit more applied than some of this other, uh, some of the other talks. Um, and over the last, uh, uh, from 2011 to 2018, so about the last eight, nine years, I've been uh, involved in uh, a project that's been uh, funded through the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative uh, to survey migration around the Great Lakes. And we're doing this using these two mobile radar units named Batman and Robin. And we've been hauling around the Great Lakes for uh, close to seven years, some of which I was involved with, some of which was before my time, but um, collected data around the Great Lakes base in the United States at 44 different sites. And over the last several years, we've been taking that data and we've been actually trying to build sort of a uh, basin-wide um, understanding of what's happening with migrants. And um, the, we're, we're coming to the completion of this project and, and the idea is that we're gonna be able to provide this product that allows people to understand how migrants are using the airspace as well as how migrants may or may not be using the area um, um, the areas where they're landing or taking off or stopover habitat. So um, we, uh, each of these sites collects just an insane number of migrant birds. So I, I think the smallest site uh, or the shortest site that we're at collected about uh, 215,000 birds over less than a week during migration. The largest that I'm aware of, um, I believe is the Chicago site, which collected 29 million bird, uh, individual bird tracks over a, um, I think a three month period. So it's, it's just tons and tons of data. And essentially what we've done is we've taken that data and combined it with some landscape data that we uh, think is gonna be really important. So landscape 
use, um, as well as things like um, nighttime light and proximity to shoreline, which we know um, has some important effects for birds, either taking off landing or, or moving around. And um, so what we've seen is that um, we can really understand sort of from the basin level kind of how these animals are moving. And, and one of the things I didn't really get a chance to talk about is that um, it appears that birds are reacting to the basin as a whole, not lake by lake. So they seem to realize that it's not just they're running into one lake and they're going to be able to get over it, but it's this huge basin. And so they essentially um, split into sort of these eastern and western branches sort of um, at the bottom of the state of Michigan um, and are sort of cutting over from Chicago up through Duluth and, and sort of expanding outwards into their breeding habitat there. And then the other one, the other branch is not as clear. It's probably um, using those land bridges at uh, sort of like the Detroit, Windsor area on Lake Erie and then kind of near Niagara Falls and the Lake Erie, Ontario area. And they're sort of uh, essentially passing around these lakes. And that's really useful information to make decisions about um, conservation and, and especially stopover habitat. So I, I showed sort of a worked example of things that we're doing in conjunction with the coastal program, which has um, a lot of interest in wetland restoration and coastal west re restoration for a number of different species and habitats. Um, and so uh, this is going to be going live hopefully in the next week or two um, for public or semi-public consumption. I think you have to have a, um, a GIS subscription, but um, so this data set is going to be uh, available very soon. So um, yeah, I'll take any questions that folks have. Okay, I think uh, we're trying to see if Clinton, Clinton looks like he might be back on. Yeah, I think so, as far as I can tell. There you go. <laughs> uh, awesome. Um, so question, what's the most surprising thing you found so far through your data, Michael? Um, I think one of the things that we were not expecting is these urban areas are really pulling huge numbers of birds in. So the Chicago area, which I, I think I saw a little bit that Shanta was asking about, um, is I think the largest number of birds that are moving through. And it's not entirely clear exactly what's happening. It could be that this is just geographically a spot that birds are cutting a corner. So we see behaviorally, not only are they, they sort of hooking around this corner, but they may also be coming across um, the, the lower end of Lake Michigan. And so it could just be geographical, but the other possibility is that they're actually being attracted by these nighttime lights uh, from larger distances. And um, uh, that's been um, a, a really interesting sort of issue here that that um, we're trying to sort out is it like um, how high are these animals flying as well we have some data on that but it, it's still not entirely clear um, how that's going to be impacting in migrants um, but it seems like there is a lot of interest in kind of taking this information especially in Chicago that they're a bird treaty um, uh, city and um, they're working on trying to figure out some lights out programs and things like that to deal with this um, yeah, and then the other thing is just how ubiquitous massive migration movements are. They're really, really uh, interesting, and behaviorally, they're really interesting. So some of these animals are, are clearly just ignoring the fact that, like, Lake Superior is in front of them. They're going to be flying for multiple hours over water, um, which is most of these animals can't land on and can't survive if they do land on it. Their feathers get wet, they sink, they die, or they get killed by um, uh, things like gulls. Um, and then other ones will hit much narrower bodies of water, like Lake uh, Ontario and Lake Erie, and will refuse to go, go across, and they'll actually go around these lakes. So we don't know if we don't have good species level data because all you're getting is these little blips on the radars, um, and it's hard to, to determine that. Very good. Very good. Um, Jerry's got a question. Uh, and I'm not quite sure what this reference is, so uh, let me know if you need any clarification. But uh, so it says, why are there double spots on the map in Western Michigan? Um, oh, so the that I think that you're talking about sort of a there's there's sort of um, radar sites on the coast and radar sites inland would be my guess. Is that correct, Gerald? Um, 
if, if that if that is what you're talking about, what we're what we were doing there is we're actually running a, a uh, experiment where we're looking at inland versus coastal movement, and um, what we found is that essentially. At uh, dawn, we see migrants suddenly change their direction. They all head towards the coast, and it's really notable that there's large numbers of birds that are coming into that coast area, and there's actually quite a few more birds that are essentially piling up on the coast at dawn. Uh, what we think is happening is they're essentially finding themselves over water and just heading towards the nearest land, and they pile up pretty significantly differently than... Um, uh, even 20 miles inland. So they're, they're, they're definitely using the coastal areas at an elevated rate during the mornings. Now, we're not sure how much they're, um, how much they're redistributing over the course of the day. Um, if you've ever been to the, the eastern shore of Lake Michigan, um, there is a lot of dune habitat, but not a whole lot of forest. You have to go pretty far inland in some places to get to that. Um, and so they may be dispersing sort of below the treetops and therefore below the radar uh, beams signal um, throughout the day and then uh, sort of reposition themselves to find food and resting habitat and things like that. Um, but yeah, they're definitely using those coastal areas heavily during the, the morning times. And that's pretty much true across the basin. Very good. I don't see any new questions. Um, so. I had one just just out of curiosity saying I, I really appreciated that you kept mentioning bats. Um, oh, yeah. I, I really love that mention. I know that it's not a bird talk, but I, I appreciate that. Have you have you been able to do with bats the same thing you're doing with birds or is it impossible to tell what's what? It, it, so you have to use a very different approach. So one of the things that that um, is happening with the bats is that there's two different kinds of bats. So there's um, Non-migratory bats like um, little and big brown bats, where they'll nest, they'll they'll overwinter and hibernate in things like caves and mines and people's houses. A lot of attics will end up with these guys in. And then there's a second sort of guild of these species called the the migratory tree bats, which, as the name implies, they mostly roost in trees and they are highly migratory. We don't exactly know where they end up in the winter, unfortunately, but they they migrate south in the winter and they come north in the in the spring and summer. Um, that's a pretty major um, concern for conservation, at least from the fish and wildlife perspective, because um, hibernating bats are just getting wrecked by um, white nose. Um, migratory bats do not seem to be affected in the same ways, probably because they're heading south and they're, they're not really going to that hibernation. Um, and furthermore, they're not in these dense aggregations where the, the disease can spread. The downside is they're getting hit massively. They, they have massive fatalities around wind uh, farms. Um, and they seem to be associated with these wind farms in ways that we're still not entirely sure why they're, they're associating these wind farms. So that's been a major concern. There's actually a couple of them that are petitioned for protection right now through the Endangered Species Act. So um, in addition to the radar data, um, so the, these bats are mixed in with the birds and the radar data. We can't really tell them apart. But in addition, we've been collecting ultrasonic um, recordings of bats um, at all of our radar sites as well. So we have, uh, let's see, two to three of those per um, per uh, site. So, you know, a couple hundred, uh, a little over 120, I think, um, bat recorders. And I didn't get a chance to talk about it and it's not really relevant to a, a bird talk, but we also have maps that are built off of that data. And that's, um, it's a very different set of data and it has to be handled in a very different way, but um, we, we have maps of, of uh, bat use as well as part of this decision support tool that's being put together. Thanks for, thanks for fielding that question. Yeah, no problem. Um, one, one question from Dick that I think is interesting uh, before we move on, does one black blade on a wind turbine help? Right. And, collisions or um, for, for, Birds, we believe, there, there's some evidence that it does for birds. For bats, um, probably not. What I'm not super versed in the bat stuff, but essentially what thing, seems to be happening is they're orienting towards these, and there's a bunch of theories why. Um, supposedly, they may be lecking, uh, so they may be trying to breed at the highest point in the local landscape, and that happens to be the tips of these blades. Um, they also may be... Um, I mean, these blades are really novel and they're curious about them. So they're, they're 
they're reflecting in weird ways um, when you think about the, the sonar that they're using, that they're, they're reflecting similar to water. So they're dealing with these weird moving things that kind of look like water. And what seems to happen is they're hitting the hub and then they're following the blades down um, and the blades get faster and faster as you get closer to the, to the ends and they're nearly ultrasonic um, by the time you are supersonic by the time you get to the tips of the blades. So they're either being directly hit by the blades, which is lethal to pretty much anything, um, or they're getting caught in these negative pressure zones where it's rupturing their lungs and killing them through uh, suffocation. So um, with birds, it seems to be a lot less um, problematic. The birds are essentially, it's a filter where they're not actually associating with these turbines. They're essentially just passing through when they're migrating and they, it's, it's sort of like a sieve or a filter where a couple of them get hit here and there, but it, it, it's not the same amount of, of impact that we're seeing in bats. And I know we're getting off topic. Sorry about that. Yeah, no, no worries. Thank you. Thank you for answering those questions. Yeah, um, no awesome. So we will move right on to our next speaker, Lisa. Um, so I'm Lisa. I'm going to, my talk was on the research I did for my master's thesis at the University of Minnesota Duluth in Matt Ederson's lab. And so the objective of my research was to develop some sort of method that could be used to study diet in migrating raptors. So most dietary studies for raptors focus on breeding season, some work done in like winter habitat and stuff. Um, so to do this, I collected a bunch of cloacal swabs from raptors caught at Hawk Ridge, and then um, I used DNA metabarcoding to identify um, prey species on the swabs. So DNA metabarcoding is just a technique that can sequence many different, well, it uses a unique barcode to identify um, the prey or the whatever species in a sample, and then you use high throughput sequencing to then sequence the DNA. Um, so about 18% of the cloacal swabs I collected came back with prey DNA on them. Most of the swabs that had prey DNA on them just had one prey item. And yeah, so there's definitely like, this is the first time anyone's tried to use cloacal swabbing to study diet. So there's definitely things that can be done to improve the method. So hopefully, you know, tweaking it could get that 18% up a little higher. But yeah, um, that's kind of the short and sweet of it. So if you guys have questions. All right, first one right off the list from Shanta. Uh, what do you think? What do you think would happen if you did a cloacal swab when birds are actively breeding? Hmm. Um. Well, you might get like on male birds, you could definitely get some semen in the mix. Um. As far as like affecting like prey detection, um, I don't know if it would be that different. There's been some thoughts that like some of these species, you know, like you know, birds that, you know, migrate by soaring might just not be feeding as frequently during migration. So, you know, maybe during the breeding season for those, you know, like red-tailed hawks, you might get a higher percentage of like return of prey items on the swabs um, just because, you know, they're having to, you know, eat a lot and, you know, feed their nestlings and stuff like that. Great. Uh, next question from Kelly and Greg, do you think your method could be expanded uh, to look for insect prey in cloacal swabs. Oh yeah, definitely. So like my project, I just used, um, you know, primers that targeted mammalian and avian prey. Um, and there are definitely primers out there that target arthropod DNA, but it all costs money and stuff. So yeah, if you were looking at a bird that you knew, like, you know, kestrels that have, you know, a high insect, you know, proportion in their diet, you definitely want to use those primers. Excellent. Uh, and sort of working right into the primer question uh, from Dick, is there a central lab for barcoding that could be used by citizen science? Uh, I don't know about that. I did my work with um, a molecular ecologist at the EPA in Cincinnati. Um, I think there are some more in Europe, some general like, you know, you can just pay to send a sample to the lab um, and they'll do the whole process for you. I'm not sure if there's something like that in the United States yet. Uh, the only thing that I know of just to talk in this is moths. Um, there are public databases for moth DNA. Um, okay. Oh. It's, it's, yeah. Yeah. If they're talking about like um, a central database for like the barcodes and stuff, yeah. that would just be the National Center for um, Biotechnology Information from the 
um, and that's got all the DNA in it and anyone can like plug in a DNA sequence and see if there's a match. Yeah. Awesome. Mm -hmm. uh, so here's a good one. How did you come up with a project like this? How did you think of a project like this? <laughs> How did I think to like go stick a swab up a bird's butt? Yeah. <laughs> well, so like feces are like super common to like now in like these DNA metabarcoding studies, like a lot of them just use feces to identify food and dietary items. But for raptors, you know, so for songbirds, you just, you know, catch them, put them in a box for like half an hour, hour, you know, open the box out, they pooped and you let it go. But like raptors are really high strung birds and trying to hold them like that, they'd probably injure themselves trying to escape. So we we're just trying to think like, well, how could we get feces in a different way? And so we're like, ah, colloidal swabbing, which had been used to like study like gut microbiomes and stuff before. So, yeah. Um, I have I have one last question I think um, mm -hmm. unless we get a couple more but um, do you have do you have any more thoughts on that Sharpshin hawk data with turkeys DNA with the turkey DNA yeah um, yeah so if anyone you know didn't get a chance to watch the talk I had three Sharpshin hawks from the spring um, I did spring sampling and fall sampling and I had three Sharpshins from the spring that had um, turkey DNA on the swabs. And my theory about this was um, that they were scavenging turkey remains and that would, the samples were collected at the same time as turkey hunting season in Minnesota and Wisconsin. And then like turkey chicks don't hatch until June um, in our area. So yeah, no, I think like, um, I haven't like really changed that idea much, but I think it'd be super cool to like set up just, you know, trail cams and stuff at like turkey remains and stuff just you know, we've been talking a little bit about citizen science, you know, if, you know, you get some hunters with private land and just be like, hey, stick your trail camera at the gut pile um, and, you know, have some sort of database that they could upload their photos to. I think that would be a really great way to engage the public um, and hopefully, like, communicate about, like, you know, lead-free ammunition and stuff when people see, like, what all comes in to feed at the gut piles. Sure. Awesome. Mm -hmm. any, any last questions for Lisa out there? Otherwise, thank you, Lisa. Uh, and we will move on over to Annie and turns. All right. Thank you, Clinton. Um, my talk was about common turns. I'm a graduate student in Francie Cuthbert's lab uh, in the conservation sciences program. And my talk basically was just kind of a broad summary about common turns in general, and then more specifically in the Great Lakes. We've been using different tracking technologies to study the movement of common terns in the Great Lakes region um, and try to identify um, where they're spending their winter um, and other things about their movement that could be useful to inform conservation. Um, and then part of the discussion was just about um, historical, current day, and um, future potential issues that could affect common turn um, population stability in North America and the importance of habitat restoration and identifying locations um, internationally. So kind of trying to have more of a international perspective when um, trying to deal with these conservation issues. That's basically it. <laughs> Very good. Uh, so as we were looking at questions, one thing I thought was pretty interesting is, is the, sort of the acknowledgement of the difference in the life histories of adults and juveniles. Um, is there other studies working on those sides? I think you touched on it a little bit, but are there any more like juvenile life history type studies comparative to what you've been working on? You know, um, I'm not aware of too many. Some people that have, the nice thing about common terns is that they are one of the most well-studied birds. So there is a lot of research um, globally that people have done and some long-term field sites have used pit tags to um, track adults and juveniles, which mainly gives you information about presence, absence um, at different sites. So they're able to track juvenile movement um, that way, which, you know, pit tags are a really nice option. Um, if 
you have the means to and um, financial to support to have a long term project like that. Um, one of the issues we had with wanting to track juveniles, of course, was because they're deferred breeders. Um, there were questions about whether we would get any data back from the birds. So turns are at that threshold where like they're almost big enough to carry um, tags that you don't have to get them back, but most of them are archival. They do have small satellite tags available now, but they're extremely expensive. Um, so the radio transmitters were um, really nice because of course it collects information as the birds are moving. Um, and so that, that's been, um, what we've used so far. Perfect. Perfect. Any other questions out there from folks? We've got a couple of minutes left. I was got a question. So uh, is there any indication of birds moving to different colonies in different years? Since we have only four cell colonies in Minnesota, it seems like birds may be doomed. Is that the case? Well, um, so one of the, the parts of my dissertation that I'm working on with Todd Arnold is we have 30 years of um, data for the two Western Lake Superior colonies. Um, so we have movement information about juvenile and adult dispersal between those colonies. Of course, um, gathering that amount of information from different colony sites requires a really um, large amount of effort. Um, so, and these colonies are relatively small compared to the size of colonies on the East Coast where you have thousands of birds. We have a few hundred birds nesting. So even if we mark all of the um, chicks every year, you know, mortality is really high. And so even though we have this really rich data set, it's still for a relatively small number of individuals. Um, one interesting thing, there was a study done on common turn genetics comparing the um, inland populations, mainly in the Great Lakes to the East Coast. And based on their results, it looked like there was um, directional movement of birds from the Great Lakes to um, the East Coast. And it's believed that a lot of that has to do with um, dispersal decisions by juveniles. Um, during migration, they migrate along the Atlantic coast and spend the winter presumably in um, the south and along the coast. And that a lot of those birds just aren't coming back because they're isn't a lot of available habitat or colonies to choose from. Um, and the genetics data we collected from our turns at the colonies was suggesting that um, the immigrants that were coming in were different between um, the Duluth Superior birds as well as uh, compared to the Ashland colony, which is only 100 kilometers away. And the thought is that, we're working on it right now, but that the Great Lakes population is associated with the um, Ashland colony, but then the um, Minnesota birds are more dependent on birds from Canada coming in to um, establish and that may, potentially um, the Duluth Superior Harbor, even though it's a larger colony, might actually be acting as a sink. Um, so there are a lot of really, a lot of unknowns right now. That's like kind of a, a small part of the project that we haven't focused fully on, but it's really interesting. Um, and, and the majority of the population is in Canada where it's much more difficult to get data because um, it's harder to monitor, of course. So, um, but we think that that's where most of the um, population is being um, rejuvenated from. I, I don't think they're doomed. We'll find out, huh? We'll find out <laughs> next week. That's when I'm finishing my dissertation. <laughs> all answers, no. Perfect. Perfect. Uh, all right. Thank you, Annie. Um, let's move on to our next speaker, Allie. All right. Thanks, Clinton, and thanks, everyone, for coming today. Um, just to introduce myself, I'm a second-year master's student at UMD. Um, in the Integrated Biosciences program under Dr. Matt Ederson. Um, and for this year's paper session, I gave a short presentation introducing my master's research being conducted in collaboration with Hawk Ridge Bird Observatory. Um, so for my research, in a nutshell, I'm investigating the subspecies origins of Dartmouth red-tailed hawks migrating through Minnesota. Um, so to give you a little perspective um, relative to 
the subspecies ranges across the country. Minnesota is located in the eastern subspecies range um, known as BJ borealis. And so these eastern birds are known to only have a light morph in their plumage. So um, red-tailed hawks are polymorphic, so they can come in various color morphs such as light, dark, and intermediate. Um, but here we expect to see only light birds. Um, however, dark morph red-tailed hawks are being observed and documented migrating and sometimes wintering in Minnesota. Um, so we're interested in figuring out where they're coming from on a geographic perspective as well as a phylogenetic perspective. Um, so over time, several hypotheses have been developed regarding their origin, and one of the most popular being that they're coming from the Western subspecies called BJ Caloris. Um, so Caloris is known to have both light and dark morphs. Um, however, we think that after developing some rationales and having some really knowledgeable people in the field for a while that these birds, these dark birds moving through Minnesota aren't actually Caloris birds, we think that they're being sourced from an unofficial, quote unquote, um, subspecies of red-tailed hawks called BJ beticola. And so BJ beticola comes from the northern um, parts of Canada. Um, they're known to be kind of in the firs dwelling up there. That's kind of where their namesake comes from. Um, and so they're not currently recognized as a, as a subspecies by the American Ornithological Society, but they are a diagnosable phenotype and a lot of people refer to them as a subspecies. Um, so essentially to better understand the genetic and geographic origins of the dark morph birds um, relative to currently recognized subspecies and their breeding grounds, we're collecting several types of data, um, such as phenotypic data, meaning morphological measurements and plumage photos. Um, we're also collecting genetic data, such as blood, um, so DNA from blood, and we're also collecting spatial data, so using satellite transmitters, and um, we have four satellite transmitters that we have right now. One of them's been deployed already. Um, we're doing two dark morph birds and two light morph abeticola birds um, to kind of act as a control, um, and so we're hoping with these three types of data, we'll be able to kind of pinpoint and determine the origins of these dark morph birds through Minnesota, and um, our first field season just wrapped up. We sampled uh, 83 red-tailed hawks, 81 of those being light morphs, three, two of those being dark morphs. So we're excited to see um, where this data will take us, and we still have a lot of future directions to go um, in the next year. So hoping to share some results with you guys at next year's conference. Very good. Uh, any questions for Allie? I know, I know I've got one. I like dark red tails, but um, do, do you have plans to just use birds you have in hand or are you gonna also look through eBird photos and do that whole thing like Brian? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So our primary goal right now is to sample as many, all migratory birds that we can in the fall. Um, and then to kind of boost up our sample size, we're doing any darks, maybe some lights wintering in Southern Minnesota as well to at least get our remaining transmitters out. But to um, kind of determine where these birds are coming from, we need to build up reference populations. And these reference populations are made up of breeding birds. So what we're gonna do for that is do, um, we're going to use already predetermined genetic data from sources um, like from Josh Hull or GenBank um, who've already developed um, sequences for Caloris birds and Borealis birds. Um, we're also going to possibly use museum specimens um, in order to boost up our sample sizes for breeding birds, um, as well as any kind of live breeding bird sample sizes. So potentially next summer I'll go around and try to sample um, different subpopulations across the country if it's feasible. Cool. Thanks. Uh, Good question here. Uh, how do you capture these raptors to attach the transmitters? Yeah, great question. So um, Hawk Ridge Bird Observatory is really well known for their banding program. Frank Nicoletti is their banding director. And so how this works is we are, one, we're permitted to capture the birds safely. Um, we are going to um, essentially use lure birds that attract the raptors from the sky. Um, they're live birds, they're not harmed, they're safely um, attached to some strings and we just kind of manipulate them a little bit to make them look injured and the birds are captured in the nets very quickly 
Um, and so once we extract them from a net, um, we ban them and we take measurements from them and then um, we attach the transmitters on them using kind of like a harness backpack system. Very good. Uh, genetics question for you. Uh, from Keith, are you going to t you are you going to target loci that might influence plumage color, like MC1R genes? Yeah, that's a great question, Keith. And to be completely honest, this is still very new to me. I'm more of a field ecologist, but I'll answer your question as best as I can. Um, so I'm collaborating with a guy called Dr. Eric Waits at the Genetics Laboratory in Cincinnati, Ohio, um, from US EPA, and he's working with me to work on. Which, we're, which molecular markers we're gonna use. And so far what we've discussed is that um, we have been looking at um, CO1, ND2, cytochrome B, and D-loop. Um, and to the best of my knowledge, I don't know if those have to do with plumage markers, but um, I'd be happy to chat with you later and give you a better answer. Awesome. Uh, thanks, Allie. And I think we'll move to the last speaker, uh, Emily. Awesome, thank you, Clinton. And thank you to everyone for sticking around to the bitter end. Um, so my name is Emily Pavlovic, and I am also a master's student at the University of Minnesota in Duluth um, in the Integrated Biosciences program, and also advised by Matt Ederson. Um, so I'm completing my thesis research also at Hawk Ridge in Duluth, and I'm focusing on improving our knowledge of migratory connectivity for the raptors migrating um, through Duluth during fall migration. So as a lot of you probably know, Hawk Ridge has an amazing long-term data set that's been um, collected over decades of counting and banding, and um, we've learned a lot of interesting things from that data set. Um, but one thing that would really help us to understand um, this data a little bit more is to know where these birds spend their time before actually coming through Duluth. Um, so this is kind of what my research is focusing on. So this fall, um, I collected feather samples from three different species, sharp -shin hawks, northern sawwet owls, and red-tailed hawks. And I plan on analyzing these feathers for hydrogen stable isotopes um, to estimate their breeding origin, as well as to determine migration patterns um, in terms of their um, passage date through Duluth. Um, so just to kind of give you an idea of what we kind of hope to, or one context of how we can hope to apply this um, knowledge, um, has to do with environmental contaminants. So um, we've done a lot of monitoring of um, environmental contaminants over the years, and we've noticed that certain species have higher concentrations, um, but within species there is still like a lot of variability between individuals. And so the, one of the hopes with this is that we could use this technique to determine if there are certain regions that birds are coming from that have these higher concentrations of contaminants in their, in their bodies. Um, and maybe this could allow us to target those areas for remediation or for conservation into the future. Um, so unfortunately, I don't have any results as of yet since the field season just wrapped up, um, but I'm happy to answer any questions and hope that I can share with you next year about what I determined. Very good, thanks Emily. Uh, questions out there for Emily from folks. All right, question here from Stephen. Emily, you mentioned other research using hydrogen isotopes in birds, bats, or butterflies. Um, could you give examples of what they studied and discovered? Yeah, so um, usually when researchers are studying things using hydrogen isotopes, they are studying migration. And so um, people have done similar things to what I'm planning to do. So looking for patterns in the migration as well as origin. Um, so those have been things that have been looked at for all of those species that I mentioned, um, birds, bats, and butterflies. So for instance, monarch butterflies are a very popular study system. and um, uh, part of 
oh, you know, what they have done with monarchs is, is taking samples from them and then trying to determine where it was that they came from. So if they haven't been tagged um, before their migration, uh, can we determine where they were before um, they got to, you know, maybe their, their uh, place in, in Mexico? Um, and then what was the second part of your question? By the way, the pattern of clear isoscopes. Yes, I agree. It is very interesting that we can use these patterns of um, hydrogen isotopes that are deposited via water to learn these really interesting things. So I, I definitely agree with you. All right, another question here. Uh, for Steve Weston, do we know that the birds acquire their feathers reliably in the breeding area? So excellent question. Um, so for this um, and for my project, um, I'm only analyzing juvenile feathers um, because that is really, you know, the best way to know that they were produced on the breeding grounds. Um, and so that's kind of one of the limitations with using hydrogen stable isotopes is that for adult birds, it becomes a little bit more complicated and the processes that the hydrogen isotopes go through um, and the retention times in the body uh, make that assignment a little bit more difficult. So yeah, very good question. So sort of in line with this question is, is looking at a combination of what, what Ali is working on. Um, could you use stable isotopes uh, to, to look at where dark morph red tails are coming from? Yeah, exactly. So um, that is why I'm uh, analyzing feathers from uh, red tails, actually. So they're the same birds that Ali has been taking samples from. And so the hope is that we can um, use all of those different combinations of data um, to better understand where they're coming from. And really, like, that is the best way that we can learn about organisms is by com combining genetics and isotopes and banding data and transmitters all together um, to, to create this whole big picture. So yeah, I'm really interested uh, to see what that data produces, because it can be really, really cool. Very good. Still time for one more question, if there's a question out there. Maybe. Give it a couple of seconds in case someone's still typing. All right. Well, thank you, Emily. Thank you, speakers. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, I guess since I have a reliable connection, not to take over the last spot in the talk, I can finish answering the questions that I, that I had from folks, if, if you have them, uh, if you've got them. I know I lost the, the question from Jerry about aging and sexing. Um, so I can start there as, as we're thinking about kestrels and raptors and feathers and all this crazy stuff. Uh, yeah, so aging and sexing birds, easy way to do is by looking at their feathers. It's pretty reliable across the, the development of a bird when its feathers come in and what that might look like, even across populations. So um, it's, it's pretty easy to say, oh yeah, this bird's 12 days old, this bird's 20 days old, this bird's 13 days old. Um, there's a, a in, my, in my PowerPoint, I showed a slide with um, the, the Hawk Mountain had a really nice they had boxes that opened up, took pictures every day, and you sh they showed you young birds, which was really great. Um, and so if you're, in, you can look at that. It's not a, a, a private document. Anybody can look at that document if you want. It's a, it's a super cool thing. Um, but yeah, as soon as those feathers erupt, um, you can, you can sex them pretty reliably. Um, so there's the one case for the sort of the confusing part about one of the boxes. And I mentioned a box with six eggs. Um, all the chicks were significantly differently aged and that doesn't really happen. Usually a bird's going to hatch pretty much in succession. So um, we had a box where the birds were 14 days, 17 days, and like 20 days or something like that, aged old. And that was a, a, a box that re-nested. And so that was a pretty odd thing to, to, to open up a box and see three chicks that are very differently aged, very differently sized. Um, typically, it's pretty much in order. So, um, yeah, that, that's the, the long and short of it. If we look at feathers, we can pretty easily do it. I know with peregrines, you can, you can look at the, the width of their feet uh, or 
their their tarsi and you can sex them that way. We don't really need to do that with kestrels. They develop a little bit faster. So, um, uh, kestrel question here: Do kestrels uh, reuse the same nesting box year after year? Um, that's a great question. Uh, we don't really know. And so I, I, I talked a little bit about how we wanted to do some color banding, um, color band adults that are in boxes to see if they come back. Um, I hope we can do that because that would, that would answer that question. Um, longevity for kestrels isn't very, very long. You know, they're not living, uh, I think the average is closer to one year but that's because juvenile mortality is so high in raptors. So like, you know, reliably maybe 10 years for a kestrel for longevity, uh, but we really don't know. And, and so the boxes that have been active for five years, I assume it's the same pair in that box, but I'm not sure. We haven't banded those adults, so we don't know. Um, if ever we had a, a bird that, you know, when we were monitoring, if it flipped over and showed us its talons, we could see if that bird's banded. Potentially we could read that band later. We could catch that bird in the box to know, but we hope to, we hope to do that. Uh, nest predator question. Uh, this is a really good one. I, uh, Julian ans asked the same question to me and he wondered why we don't put uh, predator guards up. Uh, and we just really, we don't have a lot of nest predators compared to what's in Southern Minnesota. So uh, I've never seen a live raccoon in the bog. I've seen a couple road kills. I've never seen an opossum in the bog. Um, you know, we have Martins and we have a lot of mustelids. Those are our, really our biggest um, nest predators for us, um, but where we're putting boxes sort of is, is hopeful that they are not there. Um, so, you know, in egg lands, you're not expecting pine martens to be running around farm fields. Um, maybe the weasels would, but I would hope they would stick close to the barns because that's where all the mice are. Um, so the predations that we've had, uh, one was pretty clearly mammalian. Um, so, you know, feathers in the box still, and like it was pretty rough. Um, the other ones, they were just gone. There were no chicks in the boxes. So potentially uh, other raptors to um, goshawks and, and cooper's hawks, but I'm not sure if they will actively predate cavity nests. So that's just something I would, I would need to look up. We don't have a lot of cooper's hawks anyways. I know they're a big problem in the southern parts of the range of kestrels. Um, the increase in cooper's hawks is really dramatically impacting kestrels. Um, as soon as those young get out of the box, coops are taking them. Um, we don't have that problem, thankfully, up here. Um, maybe goshawks, but in the diet studies I've read on goshawks, I've never seen kestrels mentioned. So, um, yeah. Uh, last question here. Uh, so I mentioned uh, one of the suspected reasons for kestrel declines is the decline of their food source, which would be insects. Uh, have there been any insect surveys done at the bog in conjunction with the kestrel nest box monitoring um, or any other kest? Uh, Kestrel nest box programs. That's a really good question. And so uh, maybe the easiest way to answer that question would be to look at what we've found when we've looked in boxes. Most of the prey remains that we're finding when we're banding chicks is insects, I would say. Uh, mostly dragonflies and grasshoppers. Um, we'll find a vole here and there, maybe a bird foot, but a lot of that extra stuff is insects. So uh, are we doing it directly? Not necessarily. Um, we use iNaturalist a lot in the bog. Um, really, just to serve my purposes, I'm interested in the bugs uh, generally. And so uh, it would be important to take a look at that. Um, it would be very hard to do that, though, because we have so many boxes. I usually try to you know, look at what's around the box when we're there. Um, but really, reliably, th thinking back to DNA and all this DNA talk we've had, um, cloacal swaps with insects, especially, you know, grasshoppers, dragonflies, that would be very interesting to see. But um, right now there's there's nothing sort of in that realm other than um, the citizen science work that we're doing um, just generally. Um, one weird insect thing, if, if you like to hear about weird insects things, um, most of the Phytopus borealis, so boreal tufted jumping spiders that I've seen in the bog have been on poles with Kestrel boxes, which is pretty weird. Um, that's a spider that it's pretty cool jumping spiders generally, but um, potentially there might be something there. If I've seen two of them on two kestrel poles during sampling, maybe there's a benefit to kestrel boxes for jumping spiders, who knows? Um, but yeah, thanks for the question. If anybody's got another one, I think there's maybe time for one more. Um, otherwise, uh, if there's any sort of like 
feedback things and all that. I don't know if Dick or if Bob or if Car, if you have a way to take feedback from folks, we could put it in the chat right now if you wanted. Uh, I'm sure there's an email that we could send um, if you have thoughts about this. Uh, and I know we have a couple of more minutes uh, before the, the, the meeting was supposed to start. So I guess if there's any other general questions, we could take those unless Dick, you have other things to mention, other things to say. No, I just wanted to uh, thank everybody for staying on board and watching. And um, this is obviously a new format. We're not planning to use that next year. We're hoping to be live uh, again at the St. Paul Student Center, but um, who knows if we can use this format again. So we're open, we're open for ideas and, and questions and suggestions on how to do this better. You know, this, the uh, learning curve is quite steep for this uh, technology for many of us. And so um, if you have any idea, let us know. Either um, you can put it in the chat now or you can send uh, Clinton an email or you can send me a Cl an email and uh, we'll, uh, we'll respond. It's, I'm delighted that we've had, uh, we had 72 uh, people come on board or 72 computers, so there's more than 72 people. And that's, uh, that's a wonderful uh, uh, response to this. So I'm, we're open for suggestions on how to improve it. And I do wanna thank all of the speakers, the, the, the science that was produced and displayed in the papers in the presentations was spectacular. It's just an amazing uh, diver diversity and significant type of science that's being done. And so it's delightful to see this level of science uh, in Minnesota. I think we, uh, we should be very proud of all of the presenters for the level that they've done and uh, delighted that they were willing to uh, share either their uh, develop research or their new uh, approach to research. Uh, I think it's very good and um, we're open for, for questions.